before you get started, and theology is the study of God, right? It's different from religion, okay? R.C. Sproul says that religion is the study of how man conducts himself in worship to a deity. We're not worried about that this morning, right? We'll get there eventually in what they call ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. But we're not going to concern ourselves with, with our religious study of how and why we conduct our services in the way that we do. This morning, we're talking about theology. We're talking about studying the object of our worship. The person who we worship is God. There is one supreme ultimate being, and we, we are created with the purpose of worshiping him. As I explained it to our younger kids this week, God created us with a purpose, and that purpose was to love him above all else. That's what worship is. Now imagine this. Imagine you um, get married to someone you love and you have zero interest in them at all. Does that make any sense? No. No. It, it makes no sense for us to say that we love something above all others and be absolutely uninterested in, in, in that person. Right? I've, I've been married 14 wonderful years to the same woman who has graciously put up with me for that long. Right? A, yes, amen. That's right. <laughs> and, and you know what I have found? Over the years, I discover things about her that I never knew 14 years ago when we got married. Had no clue that, that she was that type of person, right? And she, I'm sure she has discovered all kinds of things about me in that same amount of time. But here's my point. If if we, in, in the relationships that we have as human beings, can never fully exhaust the depth of the knowledge of a, of a person, right? You are always going to learn something more about your spouse. You are always going to learn something more about your friends, right? They're this, they're this potentially infinite creature that, that God has created with extremely complex and sometimes very confusing thought processes. Am I right, man? Ladies, you don't, you don't understand us any better, so it's okay. Um, we, just, we just think differently. And something about that makes that, that mystery something worth exploring for a lifetime. We're created in the image of an infinite God who has created us with finite little minds that are absolutely blown away by His eternal nature. And He designed us that way I believe, for exactly that purpose, to blow our minds, to make it so that no matter how much we know about him, there's always something more to know. And you can never exhaust your knowledge of God. When you think you've got it figured out, I promise you, you are as far from having it figured out as you ever have been. What, one of the things that I learned as, as I got into my, my theological education in college, I, 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 was, I was a pretty good uh, reader of the Bible, but I discovered something very strange in high school. See, we had the, I don't know if they still do this, the accelerated reader program. You read a book, you take a test on it, you answer about five or ten questions, depending on how long the book was, and you earn points. And you were supposed to earn so many points. Well, I love to read. And when I saw that the Bible had books of the Bible in there that, that had a test, I'm like, man, that's easy. I learned something very different about myself that way. See, I always read the, the Scripture devotionally. Nothing wrong with that. I asked myself, what, what could it tell me about how I should live and what I should do? But the Bible's not that kind of book. It can be used for that purpose, but it's not that kind of book. The, the Bible is actually a, a description of God revealing Himself to His people. And, and it actually isn't a devotional per se, it's a record of how God is gradually unfolding His character and His will to His people. And there's something very unique about that, right? God wants us to know Him, but He's ultimately unknowable until He reveals Himself. And so the, the question really becomes, how are we to study God? How do we study God? If, if he's ultimately unknowable until he reveals himself, then we, then we have to make some assumptions before we can even get started. And that's not a bad thing, right? To recognize the assumptions that we bring 
to our understanding of God. Because what happens in the world is, is they'll present you with a, a naturalistic point of view that the, the world that you see and can define with your five senses is all that there is. And there's nothing outside of that. There's only nature. There's nothing supernatural. But they come to that with an assumption that there's nothing outside of the natural world. And until they recognize that assumption, right, they're going to assume that they have none. Or how about this one? You probably heard this one. There is no absolute truth. Really? Absolutely. It's a, it's a trick question, isn't it? If you say there is no absolute truth, you're assuming that there is absolutely, absolutely one truth, that there is no absolute truth, which would make that statement completely false. Right? We bring assumptions, and until we actually analyze the underlying assumptions that we have, we might come to the study of God with wrong assumptions. And to be clear, some of these things you have to take on faith. And I'm okay with that, because what faith is, is trust, right? That's what faith, faith is the noun, trust is the verb. Trusting something, you're trusting that pew to, to, to hold you in place. And if any of you are almost 300 pounds like me, that's a lot of trust you're putting in a piece of wood that somebody built a long time ago, right? I'm not sure sometimes when I sit down on that pew if uh, it's going to hold me. When, when you go to buy uh, folding chairs, right, the, the little camp chairs, Jonathan goes up a size. Jonathan has to buy the more expensive one, because you know what? Because I don't trust one whose weight limit is 225 pounds to hold my 290-pound self, right? You have to be sure that what you are trusting is trustworthy. So we have to make a few assumptions, right? We have to assume, first of all, that there is a God who exists. It's an assumption we're making. It's not an assumption without merit. It's not an assumption without evidence. But it is an assumption that we're making. Because there are some people who assume the exact opposite, that there is no God, and there is no supernatural. But here's, here's what we as Christians bring to the table, and we have to understand the underlying foundation of everything that we talk about is this. One, we believe that there is a God who exists. And two, that he reveals himself to us. And without that, there's no, even, there's no reason to even study God, right? Right? If a God doesn't exist and he doesn't choose to reveal himself, there is nothing that natural man can do to understand the supernatural. Nothing. But, but, we can bring that assumption to the table because there's evidence for us, and we'll get into that. The short answer is this. Just using what we call natural revelation. God reveals himself in, in at least three ways that we know of. He reveals himself in nature, which is fun because that's, a, that's an overlap with the world that we can, we can use to make a connection point, right? If, if we're going to study God and God himself created the world around us, then something in nature will testify to its origins, right? There are, there are natural laws, and working within the bounds of those natural laws I can get us to a point where we can understand that there is exactly one God, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. But just using the natural law, because God himself created that. Brett, can you help me out with the scriptures? The way I have this thing laid out on here doesn't help me. So throw up Romans uh, 120 for me if you don't mind. Thank you. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. In Romans chapter 1, Paul begins with the assumption that the world around us reveals something about the God who created it. That's good news. Because in the Psalms, here's what the psalmist says. He, he puts it a little more poetically in Psalm 19. He says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. When we look at the world around us, it reveals something about the nature of God. It gives evidence to the kind of God that we assume is there. Okay? And like I said, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a few weeks. But the second way that God reveals himself is through the scriptures. We're going to talk more deeply about the scriptures next week, but God reveals himself in the scripture. 
The, the Bible that you and I have in front of us is the revelation, the self-revelation of God. In other words, God has, through human hands, ordained this book in front of you, this, this writing. That's what the Scripture is. It's writing. The writings that have been recorded about how He has dealt with His people, who He is. He is the, he is the ultimate author. He is the divine author of the book in front of us. And He worked His way through the, the hands and the thoughts and the processes of mankind to Show himself to us. 2 Timothy 3.16. If you'll throw it up there for me, Fred. It's a, it should be a, a familiar passage for us. It says, all scripture is inspired by God, literally breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. In other words, everything we need to live in accordance with God's plan for our lives is revealed to us in the Scripture. He is self-revealing. If He doesn't do that, we don't know anything about Him. Remember, nature reveals His invisible attributes, His divine nature, right? It, it's enough to, for us to know that He's there, but without the Scripture, we don't know what He's like. In the Scripture, we find a God who describes Himself to us. We find a God who cares and loves his people. We find a God who his ultimate desire was to create a people who loved and worshipped him. We also find that we kind of messed that up. Right? Adam and Eve partook of, of the fruit that had been forbidden to them. And in, in bringing sin into the world, they brought death. And everything wrong with the world around us is the result of sin. Which is why, when we look at nature, yes, it reveals the, the, the power of God, but there's something flawed in it. Sin has come in, death has come in, decay has come in because of sin. And so nature itself is not a, a trustworthy witness to the existence of God. But the Scripture is, right? The Scripture is. But the, the most important way that we know God exists, the most relevant and the most powerful example of his self-revelation was when he decided to become one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the Father. While we can see from the world around him what he's like and we can know his divine nature and from the scriptures we can know what he's done in the past, it's through Jesus that we finally see a clear articulation of God's plan for mankind. How his deep, deep love for us led him to leave his throne in heaven and to assume the form of a man. To be born as a truly human being. And he came, John 1.18 says, because no one has seen God at any time. God is spirit. He's invisible. So once again, we can't trust our, our, our five senses to say what, what all is there, can we? There are things in this world that are completely undetectable by our five senses, right? Some of our, some of our senses are, are a little off, right? Some of us can't see very well. That's why I wear these, right? Which begs the question, if I'm going to put all of my trust into my five senses, why would I trust something that we know is so untrustworthy, right? If I take these glasses off, I can't even see Miss Cat's face very clearly. So if I, if I can't see physically with my five senses, how in the world am I going to trust my five senses to lead me to the person and work of God? I can't. I can't. There are a lot of things that our five senses are good for, and we'll get to that in a second. But no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. That's Jesus, right? Right? John begins his gospel with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so Jesus, the second person of the triune Godhead, assumes the nature of a man. He is born as a man. He is truly a human being. And he, as a visible human being, is able to explain what you and I have never seen because he has existed from eternity past. We'll get to Christology in a few weeks. But Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God himself. Colossians says it this way, he is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn of all creation. The image of the invisible God. I teach, I teach my teenagers and I teach kids when we talk about the, the image of God, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? You know, there's, there's so many different ideas about does God somehow look like us? It boils down to this. If God, who is invisible, were to take on a physical form, what would he look like other than the creature he created in his image? Jesus is the ultimate revelation of him. He called, he's called firstborn of all creation, not because he was ever truly uh, born in the sense of he was born to the Virgin Mary, but he was not born as if he had a beginning point. He is firstborn of all creation in the fact that of all created things, think about it, Jesus actually came very late in creation, right, as a physical being. So it's not that he's firstborn in order. He is firstborn in, in position. The firstborn enjoyed a double portion. He was the, the head of the family. And so what it means to say that he is the image of the invisible God is that when God decided to make himself visible to us, he came as a man. But he possessed a divine nature that is far above and beyond anything that has ever been created on this planet. Because he, in fact, was the creator, not the created. So Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. And when we look at that, when we see that these three ways are how God has revealed himself through nature, through scripture, and through Jesus, what we find is that scripture is the first and final authority. Scripture is the first and final authority. Why? Because creation has been marred by sin, right? And Jesus, we know about Jesus through the word. So scripture is our first and final authority when it comes to theology. When you and I want to study God, Jesus has ascended back to heaven. He's no longer here like he was with the disciples for us to ask questions of him, right? And nature, as good as it is and great as the evidence that it gives us, it's not enough for us to truly know God. And so the first and final authority when we study God is the scripture. Isaiah 48 says it this way. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The, the things that you see around you, all this creation that God created for us to enjoy, is temporary. But the word of God, his revelation of himself to us, stands. It endures when all else fails. And so if we are going to hang our hat on something, if we are going to say this is the final and authority out on what we know about God, it has to be the Scriptures. Because the Word of our God stands forever. So if Scripture is our first and final authority, that means that theology is defined by Scripture. It's first. When, when we look at the ways that we can know about God, it is primary. There is no other thing that we can look at and say, oh, well, that transcends whatever Scripture says. It doesn't. There is, there is nothing you and I... Here's, here's my, my favorite one of those. I feel like God wants me to. Your feelings are subservient to Scripture. Okay? I think God wants us to, no, your thoughts are subservient to Scripture. We do not look at the Scripture and, and think with our rational thoughts, this must be what the Scripture says. No, even that is subservient. It is underneath the authority of the Scripture. Why? Because it originates from God. It is His breathed out Word. And without it, we know nothing about God. And with it, we define the parameters by which other things can inform us about our theology. Okay? So it's, theology is defined by Scripture. Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible is a precision instrument. Think about that. We, we've, we've got some, some medical folks in here. It is a fine scalpel. 
Am I right? The, the division of joints and marrow, the division of soul and spirit. Can I be quite honest with you? I'm not even sure what that means. The division of soul and spirit? That's, a, that's an extremely precise edge, is it not? It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So in other words, the scripture is sufficient for us to understand God. It is precise in what it tells us. Now, it doesn't read like a textbook. It's, a, it's an unfolding story of who God is and what he's done to bring his wayward people back to himself. But within each of those stories is a theological truth. There's something about God we learn in each of those. And, and what we're going to try to accomplish over the next few weeks is to look at the whole width and breadth of Scripture on the subject of itself, right? The Scriptures. On the subject of God who revealed it. On the subject of Jesus who came to reveal Him. It has a lot to say about those things. And it says them with precision. It says exactly what God wanted us to know about him. Now, in, in my 15 years as a youth pastor, guess what happened? I got asked a lot of questions that I couldn't answer. You know why? Because God didn't see fit to reveal some of those things to us. Did Adam and Eve have a belly button? I have no idea. I mean, they, they didn't grow in anybody's womb. God created them, so it's very possible they didn't. Or... God may have created them to look like the rest of us have with a belly button. I don't know. That wasn't important to him enough to, to, to show that to us. But the things we need to know about him are in the scriptures. They're in the scriptures, and it's so precise, right? It is our ultimate authority. When we, when we look at the scriptures, it defines our theology. Now, our theology is informed by logic and reason, okay? It's informed by logic and reason. Why? Because, well, first of all, God himself says in Isaiah 1.18, come let us reason together. God reasons with us. God's, God's reasons and God's timing and God's plan are far beyond our, our understanding, but he is reasonable and he reveals himself in such a way that we can understand it right we can understand it god god is not a god of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints first corinthians says when when paul is addressing the church and they're they're just kind of doing their own thing and everybody's just kind of chaotically yelling out and speaking in tongues and somebody's preaching over here and somebody's garbling something over here and nobody's able to understand anybody he goes that's not from god god does not author confusion god is a god of peace god is a god of reason god is logical we're able to understand him because of that now hear me clearly because this is where some of my my, my theological brethren i think go go awry and sometimes where we ourselves do. Sometimes we assume things that are not true. We assume things that are not biblical. Or we extrapolate from something we find in the Bible that's not entirely clear to us. Something we be becomes a rigid moral law in our minds. Something very similar happened with, with the rabbis and, and, and the early Jews in Jesus' day. They had taken the scripture, they had added to it, they had extrapolated from it. A, a completely different set of laws that they now enforced as God's word. When we do theology, we need to be very clear. Scripture comes first. And what we can deduce, what we can reason out, what logically makes sense must come under the scriptures. Right? It must come under the scriptures. So, for example... How, how is our salvation accomplished? Well, we, we place our faith in Jesus. We have a responsibility in there, do we not? A and yet in other parts of Scripture, it's very clear that somehow in eternity past, God foreknew and predestined those who would be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, 
Some people take this argument and run way the opposite direction and say, you know, our salvation is very dependent on the things that we do. And completely ignore the sovereignty of God, even in the midst of our salvation. Meanwhile, some of our, our more Reformed brethren completely leave choice and responsibility out of the equation and run to what's almost a predeterminism where nobody is saved apart from what God himself is planning. And that is true. But Scripture reveals both. And as we work our way through theology over the next few weeks, you're going to find that the Scripture holds things in tension. And it's in the midst of that tension where we find sound theology. I did, I did a, a series with my students one time called Tensions. And it was about theological tensions in our doctrine. Think about this. God is both three and one. And if you go too far in either direction, you're a heretic and outside of the faith. But if you hold tightly to both, recognizing that all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are all persons of the Trinity, but there is only and only ever has been one God and only ever will be one God. You will hold tightly to what Scripture says about God and what he has revealed about his nature. Now, you and I do one plus one plus one, and that equals three, but somehow in the Bible, one and one and one equals one. Okay? We'll get there. The same is true in our salvation. There is a there is a part, a huge part, that God has played in his sovereignty. But Scripture tells us we are responsible for responding in faith. We are responsible for the sinful choices that we make. And we are responsible for the faith choice that we make to follow Jesus. And those things are held in tension. And if we stray too far one way or the other, we will fall into heresies and false teaching. That's why I say the, the Scripture is a precise instrument when it defines our theology. It defines what we know about God. And our logic and our reason must come under the authority of Scripture. What Scripture reveals as true is of ultimate priority. What we can reason from that must agree with the whole of Scripture. If we cannot bring a truth statement that contains the whole of Scripture, if it violates one or the other, we have not done our theology properly. Which means that there are 66 books and a whole bunch of chapters and a big old book that we need to know really well if we're going to do theology right. If we're going to say what is true about God, it is our ultimate authority. So our theology is informed by logic and reason. But our theology is also informed by history and tradition. Our theology is informed by history and tradition. It, it has been almost 2,000 years since Jesus came and revealed the invisible God to us. And there was almost that much time where the Jews and the Hebrews had been thinking through what God had revealed to them. And you know what? None of us comes to Christ, none of us comes to God in a vacuum. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of giants of the faith. When, when, we, when I preach to you Sunday after Sunday, I, I don't just consult my Bible and reason and logic through there's a vast history and tradition in our faith where men who, let's be honest, are a lot smarter than your pastor have studied and thought through. And not all of these men have lived within the last hundred years or so. Some of these men have been dead almost as long as Jesus has. But they have thought through these things. And we can learn from them. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Paul is, Paul is writing to the church there. He says, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. He tells them, listen, you, you, you learned, and it's a little different coming from an apostle, right? That's basically the words of Jesus at that point. But he says, brethren, you, you stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. Right? The early church actually had very few written documents. 
they circulated the letters that the apostles wrote to the different churches. They didn't enjoy a bound copy of the Word of God like you and I do. They had to beg, borrow, and steal from, from the, the rabbis at, at the, uh, the synagogue to get the Old Testament. And then they had to rely on guys to copy down the letters and send it on to other churches when the apostles had written to, to the Corinthians and to the Ephesians and to the Thessalonians. And so much of their faith was handed down orally. And Paul says, you, you stand firm and hold to those traditions which you were thought, whether by word or by letter from us, which is, in fact, the Scriptures, right? When we get to the New Testament, the writings of the apostles are the Scriptures. So he says, hold to your traditions as they come out of the Scripture. So even here in 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, your traditions are underneath the authority of the Scripture. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is one of my favorite passages. It's, it's, a, it's a missions passage, and most people completely miss it, but, but think through it with me. The things which you have heard from me, that's Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, you, that's Timothy, entrust these to faithful men. Those are the men under Timothy's um, pastoral ministry, who will also be able to teach others also. This is, this is what we talked about in, in our, our last night of missions at VBS. It's called a church planting movement, Right? If one person goes and shares the gospel with just two people, but he teaches those two people to share the gospel with two more people, it exponentially grows. Exponentially. That's, that's not addition. That's not multiplication. That's multiplication on top of multiplication. To put it in perspective, after 17 times of this happening, without the first person doing anything other than teaching the first two how to do it, it's, it's enough to reach the city of Dothan, a people of about 60,000 or so. Right, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah. He helped me with that math. He's an engineer. He's good with that. So, so think about this. The things which you have heard from me, that's Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust Timothy, that's the second generation, to these to faithful men, that's a, a third generation, under Timothy, who will also be able to teach others that's a fourth generation, right? So there are, there are church fathers is what we call them. Men who, who led the church after the apostles, who, let's be honest, didn't have the time you and I have for theology because they were running for their lives. They were being beaten and imprisoned and, and stoned or thrown in, into the Colosseum to wild animals. They were burnt to death or crucified or beheaded. But these men thought deeply about what God had revealed through the apostles. And much of our theology is defined by them in that period. We'll talk about some of the creeds from some of the councils because here's, here's what happened. False teachers crept in just like Paul and Peter and James and John all warned. And Jesus warned what happened. False teachers crept in. But here's the great thing about false teachers. False teachers give us a great opportunity to define our theology. They're not good, right? We don't want lies and half-truths being taught about our God. But what happens when that happens, when the church is confronted with a heretic, which is what they called them, which is what they're rightly called, it allows us an opportunity to say, to take the sword of the Spirit and define clearly and concisely and precisely what it reveals about God. Remember? It, it's so fine a blade, it separates soul and spirit. It separates bone from marrow and joint. Think about that. When, when we are confronted with the falsehoods, it is a, it is a razor-sharp opportunity to define who God is. Which, which, over the course of the years, has made the church look reactionary, but it's not. What we're doing is we're saying, no, that's, that's a step too far. Or that's about eight miles too far from what is revealed to us in the Scripture. Why? Because the Scripture is our authority. It's informed by our history. It's informed by our traditions. But you, 2 Timothy 3.14 says, However, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom 
you have learned them. There's a lot of things that we just take in from tradition, and we really don't know where they came from. Think about that. It's, it's funny, when, when we do communion, and, and for those of you who have been here since I've been here, you know, we, I think we've done communion a little different every time we've done it. But the good old traditional Baptist way is you have all those pretty silver plates stacked up up here with the, the styrofoam cracker and the Welch's grape juice, um, and it's covered with a pretty white cloth. Do you know why it's covered with a pretty white cloth? I did not know this until I took a Baptist history class. Are y'all ready for this? So while you and I are enjoying a wonderful air-conditioned building, that has not always been the case. That's only come about in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. So it used to be they'd have to keep the windows open, let the breeze blow through to cool you down, kind of like we did Friday at the funeral. And so what happens when you open up the windows is the flies would come in. They're attracted to that food. So to keep the flies off of the Lord's Supper elements, we just put a cloth over it. And hundreds of years later, after we have air-conditioned our buildings and we pay pest control, whatever we pay them a month to come in and make sure we don't have any, any critters, you know what we still do? We still put a cloth over the elements of the Lord's Supper. Isn't that funny? Sometimes we don't even know where those traditions came from. And sometimes when we, when we realize where they came from, you know, we realize, oh, well, if we don't do it, it's absolutely not that important. There are some traditions like that. But then there are some traditions that come to us, not just from history and, and from tradition, but, but from the scriptures. Like what we did this morning in baptism. Caroline confessed with her mouth that Jesus was Lord. That, that she wants to make him Lord and Savior of her life. She confessed her sin and turned to him. And you know what scripture tells us? That's the, that's the beginning of a journey of knowing God. And the next step after you put your faith and trust in him is to obey his very first commandment. Be baptized. And it's a long tradition that has come to us from 2,000 years of church history, but it also comes from the very mouth of Jesus Christ. And that kind of tradition holds a particular weight not because of its longevity, but because of its source. And we know of that from the scriptures. So when we come to do theology, we have to remind ourselves, yes, we are informed by tradition and history. We are informed by logic and reason, but our theology is defined, defined by the scriptures. So this morning, if you've become a little laxed in reading the scriptures, it's a great time to just jump back on. We just started our new curriculum for the, the quarter. You can pick up one of those books in your Sunday school class. I think we've got a few extras if you need one. But knowing the scripture, the breadth of it, that's why we chose the curriculum we chose, because in three years we're going to cover the story of the scripture. And that story informs everything we know about God. And if we're going to study him, and love him and know him as he desires for us to know him. We have to be defined by the revelation that comes from his word.